remote procedure call. Does anyone not know what that is? So first question, does anybody not know what that is? Everybody, good, nobody raised a hand? Everybody hears me, right? Okay. So if you go to Wikipedia, you get this uh, definition. It basically says that an RPC allows one computer to call a subroutine or procedure on another computer, just what we figured it would be. The, the important point is that the programmer writes the same code regardless of whether the operation is local or remote. So what's happened over time is that the term RPC has become genericized. People mention RPC, I made an RPC to that uh, system over there. And they're not really doing this, um, what's truly an RPC. So I'm, as Martin said, I'm kind of old school. Back when I learned RPC, it was really a remote procedure call. It was nothing more. It wasn't just sending a message to another computer and having it do something on your behalf. So the definition I like to use for RPC is the true definition, which is uh, exactly as shown here. I thought that most people would understand what an RPC is. So rather than kind of belabor that point, what I'd like to do is go into the history of RPC, because I think there's a lot about RPC that you probably don't know. <clears throat> How many were programmers in the 70s? Uh, I suppose I technically was, but I was still in high school, but uh, we'll count. We, we won't count that. So you know, think about early network systems. The ARPANET, the predecessor of the internet, started in 1969. And back then, the uh, protocols between hosts were really uh, oriented toward humans interacting with applications. So you had email in 1971 and Telnet, FTP in 1973. So you had these protocols that allowed human interaction, but they didn't really allow application to application interaction. And there was interest growing in providing that. So if you go to RFC 707, which come, came about in, uh, I think, early 1976, late 1975, James White, who wrote, uh, I believe, 28 RFCs in total, wrote RFC 707 which was this high-level framework for network-based resource sharing. And it uh, built on earlier RFCs, such as 674, but what it was trying to do was address that growing interest of application-to-application -application protocols. So if you're ever bored, like maybe halfway through this talk, you might want to pull up that uh, RFC and give it a read. That was a joke. Come on. <laughs> Give me some post-lunch love here. So one of the quotes from RFC 707 is that, you know, it's exactly that, that these human engineered protocols built for allowing human interaction with systems really aren't good for resources to draw upon one another. And there were some difficulties that were addressed in the RFC as well. There was a big concern that developers of the time had no experience in building distributed applications. So how would they be able to take advantage of any protocols that were application to application when they didn't know how to do it? So the idea behind uh, RFC 707 and something called uh, the procedure call protocol was that if you build something that uh, could make it look like something they knew, then they'd be able to do it much better. And that's where this procedure call model came from. Uh, developers were already familiar with making library calls. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so, let's start treating these resources as if they're local libraries. We'll provide a library that makes a call over the network, make it look like that resource is local, and the developer will know what to do. Just calling a procedure. <coughs> Sorry. So in other words, the procedure call model would make calls just look like normal procedure calls. And here's another quote, I'm not going to read all the quotes, but you know, it's basically saying we can build protocols by just <coughs> using procedure calls, isn't that great? After all, if you're calling a procedure, you're asking something to do something on your behalf, and there's something coming back from that request to do something on your behalf. Hey, that's just like a procedure, so we'll just do it all the same way. And the RFC goes so far as to say, well, compilers generate code to do procedure calls. So we can even have compilers generating specialized code to make remote calls. You know, so instead of having a jump off to a procedure, it would actually 
incorporate some kind of proxy code that would go and make the call remotely and take the parameters, bring them back, and send them back into the program. It doesn't explain how to do that, but just mentions the idea. So there are some caveats in RFC 707 as well. Uh, one of them is that in many ways, as it says, this idea uh, kind of you know, holds together abstractly. It kind of also misleads the programmer because local procedures are cheap, you know, typically just a handful of instructions to jump to a procedure or one. And uh, local calls, or sorry, remote calls obviously are not cheap. And conventional programs kind of have one source of control, whereas distributed programs have multiple sources of control. So that's another warning that the RFC was giving us. And uh, that the applications programmer should be aware that not all interactions can be captured by this procedure call model. So you kind of wonder, you know, you've got RFC 707, it's pushing this model, but it's got these caveats as well. And you're wondering, why does it have those caveats? Last year, I was talking to an old friend of mine who's been doing distributed systems for forever. And I mentioned that I had found RFC 707 a while back and was reading it, and that's sort of the source of RPC, in my opinion. And he said, oh, 707, yeah. Did you read 684? You know, um, I should go read that. So, RFC 684 is my, by my friend Rick Shantz. And it was published in 1975, which if you look at the date is before 707, obviously the number is before 707. But as I said, 707 is kind of a culmination of, of <coughs> earlier RFCs and it's uh, almost like a summary. So 684 was really commenting on 674. And if you go read this thing, you're going to be blown away by the amount of distributed systems knowledge that's in this RFC. This is 1975. There's, you know, we talk about things today that are related to distributed systems, and some people kind of hear it and say, oh, gee, I didn't know that. And yet, here in, you know, 1975, I think we had everything we needed to understand these systems. So the, some of the quotes from this RFC, you know, procedure call may be appropriate for certain applications, but it doesn't really model what happens in distributed multi-computer systems. The procedure call is suitable for intra-process, but it's better to take some kind of an inter-process communication framework and extend that to do intra-process calls than the other way around, taking a procedure model and extending it to do uh, remote calls. That was another idea put forth here. Another quote was that the procedure call model doesn't take uh, into account the nature of a distributed system. So you start to see these parallels in RFC 707 between some of these comments in 684 and those, those caveats in uh, RFC 707. So there's no doubt that 707 really was affected by this particular RFC mm -hmm. as well, that it incorporated some of these comments just to kind of note the fact that, yes, I did read it, and you're right about some of this stuff. You know, an IPC model reinforces the idea that you have this uh, kind of multi, multiple sources of control, you have two communicating processes uh, cooperating with each other, rather than with a remote procedure model where you have one thing in control just sort of calling over to procedures on another system. And another quote is that, you know, there are certain types of operations like delayed uh, operations or prioritization that you can't really fit into a procedure call model. So again, if you ever want to, I, I was truly amazed by going to RFC 684 and reading it, and knowing it was from 1975, that we've known all this stuff for all these years. So I would go and read that RFC if you get the chance. So that's kind of what happened in the 70s. All right, who, who was practicing in the 80s? All right, now we're getting somewhere. <coughs> so I like to think of the 80s as the research to practice decade in terms of distributed systems. Lots of things were happening. You had computing platforms were going from mainframes to mini computers to workstations to 
PC is happening very rapidly. I used to work for Apollo Computer. They invented the workstation. If you read later Sun Microsystems literature, they say they invented the workstation. They only said that after Apollo was gone. So just to set the record straight, Apollo invented the workstation. <coughs> There were methodologies going on at the same time. Structured programming was kind of a favorite in the beginning of the 80s, but by the end of the 80s, everybody was into objects, and we'll talk a lot about objects. Languages, there was just an explosion of languages. There was Lisp, of course, still hanging around. Interest in uh, Lisp machines, actually, hardware machines. I used to work for Texas Instruments before Apollo Computer. And part of the group I was in was building a Lisp chip. So it was a single chip that was going to power the Symbolics Lisp workstation. Uh, Pascal, one of the first, I, I started life as an electrical engineer. One of the first programming jobs I got was Pascal programming, <coughs> but with Emacs. So I got that right. <laughs> um, you know, C was there, small talk, interest in small talk. Bjarne Straustrup had done work on C++. Bjarne is from Aarhus, if you didn't know that. <coughs> uh, he had done, excuse me, had done work on C++ into the, the, the late 70s, but it really wasn't until the 80s that it became C with glasses and later C++. Eiffel came around, Ada came around, Erlang Yay. came around. So lots of languages. And then distributed systems, operating systems, even distributed systems languages, and you know frameworks and applications. There was just a ton of research going on in that area. So we got things like the Berkeley Sockets API. We still use it. It's very useful. There was a system called Argus. It was developed at MIT by Barbara Liskov. And what Argus was, was, was focused on reliable distributed computing. It used a lot of transactions over the network, and like I said, the goal was to build reliable applications. So that was an early research system. The uh, CEDAR project at Xerox produced a paper by Burrell and Nelson called Implementing Remote Procedure Calls. How many of you have read that? <laughs> you should go get a free REAG t-shirt for that <laughs> at the Basho booth. Uh, if you ever have interest in remote procedure calls, not only should you read the RFCs that I've mentioned, you should go read this paper because it was the first time that someone actually wrote down how to do it. And anybody, like the work I've done in my career, that was required reading. Anybody doing that kind of work just really started with that paper. There was a system called Eden, which was an operating system, a whole distributed operating system, and it was based on objects and RPC. And then there was Emerald, another uh, object language that provided mobility and really focused a lot on mobile remote transparency. So you could take an object that was on one system and move it across to another system and you could be making calls to it and you didn't really care where it was. And finally, Ansoware. Ansoware was developed in the UK. Now this is mid-80s again, it's kind of like you know, the mid-70s with RFC 684, kind of amazing that they wrote that. In the mid-80s, Ansoware developed a full, kind of full system based on RPC, had all kinds of distributed services in it. Have you ever heard of a, a trader service? A trader is something that you ask for characteristics of a service or an object, and it, the trader has all these all this metadata that stores about services. So instead of, we think of a naming service. You know, you go to a service and say, hey, I'm looking for this particular service by this name, and the name service gives you a reference to that service. A trader, you go with characteristics of what you're looking for, and the trader gives you back references that fulfill those uh, queries. So the, the trader was developed as part of Ansoware. So a ton of stuff, but involved in all of it, and all that distributed systems research was RPC kind of the backbone of everything. All these systems were what you could call full stack systems. They provided everything. They had operating system, language, compiler, everything. You know, from They basically get the hardware from the vendor. Typically, the universities were working with the hardware suppliers. They would get that hardware and work with the developers at the uh, company in some cases, but basically build right on the raw hard hardware, build these systems from the, the ground up. And like I said, most of them used RPC as a key abstraction. 
by that time, RPC had just become the way of doing things. There was also a focus on uniformity, where this idea of local remote transparency was really important. There was a lot of papers about mobility and transparency, and the ability to use services no matter where they were in the network. You'd address them the same way, you would uh, send requests to them the same way. The other interesting part was this notion of a strongly typed distributed system. So you'd have a type system that spanned the system, and every component in the system would make use of that type system. And that was a goal of a lot of these uh, efforts as well. And not only that, they wanted to have compile time type checking. The reason for that was that at this time, you know, the, the performance of computers aren't, weren't quite what they are today. Uh, let's just say they were quite a bit slower. So compiled code was king if you had things like that's why they were building a Lisp chip, because Lisp interpreters were too slow at the time. So everything was trying to go into hardware, go into compilation, and uh, even across the distributed system, checking types at compile time. Some of the protocols that were in use in these systems, uh, you know, the research papers, if you go read them, they almost never talked about the actual on-the-wire protocol. They didn't define how you put messages on the wire. They didn't define what the messages looked like. They didn't really define how these types of their type system translated into bits on the wire. These things were closed. They weren't looking to interoperate. Remember, they're trying to build a system that can almost take over the world, right? They want a single homogeneous system with the same type system everywhere. They're not interested in the fact that a university across the street is doing the same thing at the same time and maybe having them talk to each other. And again, this RPC, you know, it's just this black box. By then, everything was going to be done through RPC. You didn't worry about the RPC. It was just going to be there. So what happened as a result of all this? Well, in industry, you started to see distributed systems appear as well. And uh, what happened is you'd get vendors supplying their full stacks, right? Back then, every vendor supplied the hardware and the software. You know, Microsoft came along and started supplying just software in the 80s, but they weren't really doing distributed systems at that time. So anybody doing these network systems were building the network cards, doing the hardware themselves, doing the operating <coughs> systems themselves. And again, these were homogeneous systems. There was really limited interoperability. So they had to take the research and somehow get it into practice. And um, the vendors really needed to adopt the research that was going on in the universities. But the problem was they had their full stacks and they didn't want to take their stack and kind of throw it away and take this research stack and replace it. And uh, porting that kind of stuff into their system was hard because again, two incompatible stacks. And of course you needed compilation to get the performance that was necessary. There was really nobody interested in building this kind of stuff on top of virtual machines or interpreters at that time. The other thing the vendors wanted were standards. The um, you know, users started to have heterogeneous networks because of that mainframe to mini to workstation to PC. All of a sudden, uh, users would have a mainframe. They'd have a few minis. They'd have a bunch of workstations and PCs, and they needed them to interoperate. The only way to make that happen was to start leaning towards standards. So these uh, users started asking for portable operating system interfaces for languages that would run across all the systems that they had to work with and for network protocols and um, you know, the actual network standard itself to make these systems talk to each other. In terms of languages, I've already covered that researchers were building their own languages. They had operating systems, languages, all distributed, all kind of homogeneous and monolithic. But industry, because of the users, wanted to use standard languages. So that's another problem they had. So the vendors started to adopt some of the research ideas, but they did so by keeping their own stacks and using standard languages. And some examples of that, again, Apollo was an amazing place in terms of the technology they produced. Uh, one of the things they built was called the network computing system. It had uh, an interface definition language. It's the first time I'd ever seen an interface definition language that was actually used in production. 
I believe the IDL, I could be wrong about this, but I believe the IDL started out as a way for Apollo to support multiple programming languages but have a common set of headers. So they would generate a C header and a Pascal header from this IDL. But then this team kind of adopted it and said, oh, we could use this for, for our networking. They would basically use it to build stubs, you know, client and server side stubs for the uh, RPCs. Then Sun had their RPC, the Open Network Computing RPC, very similar. And anybody, you know, Digital Equipment Corporation, and IBM, HP, all, all these, NEC, you know, they all had these kinds of projects going on. Of course, the, the internet was still growing. So ARPANET converted to TCP IP in early 1983. And so basically, once that happened, you started to have this interoperability that was needed across these systems. Because by the, uh, say, the mid to the end of the 80s, industry started to adopt TCP IP. That's actually one of the reasons why Apollo eventually disappeared, was they had their own proprietary network. It was a token ring network. It was very cool, very fast for the, for the day. But the users didn't want a closed network. They wanted TCP. All right. I didn't ask any questions during that part, so. <laughs> Did I ask any questions? No. All right, so now we're gonna get into the 90s. Hopefully there were more of you practicing by then. Good, good. That's true, I always ask that question. All right, get into one of my favorite topics, distributed objects. Spent a long time doing this kind of stuff. So because of all the vendor uh, interest in, in making these distributed systems available to their users, all the research that was done in the 80s, and this kind of heavy focus on object-oriented programming, by then, objects were just the only way to develop software. If you were anybody, you were doing object-oriented programming. And uh, as a result, you know, distributed systems plus object-oriented programming equals distributed objects, and all the vendors had their distributed objects uh, projects going on. I worked by then HP at bought Apollo. I worked on uh, the core bus stuff starting in 1991. But um, there were a number of companies that kind of fed stuff into Corba based on these projects that they had. So Corba was this uh, industry standard taking contributions from a number of companies. I think at the height of the object management group, which which created Corba. The object management group was founded in 1989. Corba was first published in 1991. But at the height of the object management group in the later 90s, I believe there were over 700 member companies contributing to Corba and the services around it. But Corba was really based on this research that I described. Languages were very important. So they wanted the first Corba spec specified a mapping for the C language, and then later came C++. I worked several years on a C++ mapping. Uh, local remote transparency was very important for the reasons I mentioned earlier. And like I said, it was all distributed objects. Now here's a question. How many of you bought this book? <laughs> a few, awesome, thanks. Um, I was a co-author here with Michi Henning, 1999. I just got my royalty check on Friday. It still earns money, <laughs> almost 14 years later, which really surprises me. I had a, a tweet, uh, I think it was last year sometime, because a royalty check comes in and it was for $24.30 or something. And I said, well, that must mean Corvus finally dead because you know, no more royalties. But the next one was several hundred dollars, so it's still going, it's still going. But while uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in Corva, I also have this hobby of watching kind of old TV series from the 60s. It's when I was a kid and I loved some of those shows back then. And uh, everybody heard of Mission Impossible? Like the original Mission Impossible. Uh, I got something to show you. They were way ahead of their time. Cobra has a reputation for ruthlessness, Jim. I don't know whether it's justified or not, but I'm worried. We should have a lawyer standing by. I'll get the best man in town. What about Cobra? Don't worry about Cobra. Pushing <laughs> Cobra that way won't work. You are here because Corbin has decided to kill you. I heard 
that Corbett has a special way of getting rid of his prisoners. For good. That's all that's left of Corbus' victims. Stay out of Corbus' way. Don't you see what he's trying to do? Stay away from Corba. You won't do any good. He'll just use you, that's all. <laughs> Corba sounds like a borderline psychotic. <laughs> <clears throat> that's real. <laughs> Corba there was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a gentleman by the name of Manuel Corba, a corrupt uh, police chief in some Central American country. But I, it just struck me when I saw that episode, it, it zooms in on this door that's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, it zooms in on this door that says Manuel Corba, and I thought, well, that's just a translation in their language to Corba Manuel. <laughs> but I just thought that was funny, I had to include it. <clears throat> a note on distributed computing. How many people have read that? <clears throat> a few. I encourage people to go uh, look that up in their search engine and read that as well. Basically, uh, Jim Waldo was, uh, when I first started working on Corva, Jim was the, the technical leader of the group I was in at HP. He later went to Sun. He developed things like uh, Ginny and helped develop RMI. So Jim and Ann Walrath, Jeff Wyant used to live down the street from me, and I used to babysit his children, but he was unfortunately killed in a plane crash. And then Sam Kendall wrote this important paper in 1994, and it explained why distributed objects and local objects really can't be treated the same way. And this was a bit of a backlash, because Jim had been involved in Corba, and he didn't like the way things were going up to that point. So it started in you know, around 1990. They published the first spec in 91. This is 1994. Jim had kind of been pushing for certain changes to Corva, but not really getting anywhere. So this paper was kind of a reaction to that. Uh, they talked about these differences between you know, latency in terms of local versus remote. The access models, if you're accessing a local object that's quite different than accessing a distributed object. Partial failure, which is where you get net splits or uh, part of your cluster fails, and how do you deal with that? Well, that doesn't really happen in the local case. It's either all or nothing, but in a distributed case, you can certainly have partial failure. And then finally, concurrency. And this goes back to what was said in the uh, RFCs in the 70s. You know, they're talking about these single points of control in the local case versus multiple points of control in the distributed case. And because you have multiple points of control, you do have concurrency. And you get quotes like this from, from a note on distributed computing. There's two, uh, two things being emphasized in the work that was being done at the time. Integration with languages and the problems inherent in distributed computing. And the paper says both are necessary. And I think if what you look, if you go look at some of the things I've talked about, some of them really focused heavily on languages and kind of forgot the distributed computing part. There's also a, a thing called the fallacies of distributed computing put together by Peter Deutsch. And these are the fallacies. I believe the, the final one was added by James Gosling uh, later, but it's all the stuff that we kind of know the network is reliable. No, of course it isn't. Latency, you have latency. Um, you just have to deal with all these problems in a distributed environment that you just don't have to deal with when you're dealing with a, a local system. 
We can talk about Java in the 90s, obviously, that's when it really came to, to the forefront. <coughs> and there's a ton of stuff going on in Java, distributed computing, we couldn't really cover it all here, but when you think about it, a large part of kind of what you might call mainstream Corva, adop Java adopted Corva, which made sense because all the guys at Sun that were involved in Corva were also involved in Java. They wanted to reuse these services. So you look at the Java naming service, it's really just a layer over the Corva naming service, for example. Um, RMI was interoperable with IALP, we made use of the uh, inter-org protocol from Corva. Now, what really got me were these um, efforts later to take Java and just make like a homogeneous system out of that so that Java could talk to Java, but then also kind of have a way to leak out into Corva. And they started adding things from the language, you know, kind of basically from Java, adding into Corva, which is supposed to be language independent. Objects by value were basically uh, that was just a way of taking a Java class and passing it over the wire, but kind of treating it abstractly like it's a Corva object, but not really a Corva object, which stayed put. It was a Corva object by value. It was actually a value object that got sent over the wire. And these things were, it was just a nightmare of, uh, if you've ever done, how many of you have done standards work? Mm, poor man, poor man, yes. Fun? Anybody enjoy it? There's actually some sickos out there that do enjoy it. <laughs> and they're always there. You can see them you know, on this standards body, and then you go, I'm tired of that one. I think I'll go work on this. Whoa, it's like opening the door, and you see everybody close the door, and then you go open this door, and everyone in the same exact room, you know, all the same people are there. Um, reverse Java to IDL mapping. So instead of writing IDL to describe your objects abstractly, and the that essentially the protocols you use to talk to those objects. You would write things in Java and then map that backwards to IDL and you get this kind of horrible IDL out that then everyone not using Java had to go and try to implement and make sense of. So in case I wasn't clear, I didn't like these things. <laughs> <coughs> All right, also in the 90s you had the rise of the web. And of course, you know, Corva and Java really focused on the enterprise, and then SOAP came later. I haven't mentioned Microsoft at all. I'm, it's kind of like, you know, you had distributed COM, which was kind of like Corva, so you could lump those together in the sense of they're both trying to do the same thing, so I'm not really going to talk about that, but uh, there was this enterprise focus for this stuff, but meanwhile, the web was just taking over the world. And when you think about distributed objects and the web, the web itself is distributed objects when you think about it. Every resource on the web has a fixed set of methods. So instead of having a variable uh, collection of methods to invoke on the object, you just have get, put, post, delete, the HTTP methods. The coupling is done through hypermedia rather than through specialized methods and specialized data types as it is done in other distributed object systems. And it's also language independent, which was the target of things like Corva. But it was also designed specifically for large-scale networks. I'll talk a little bit about that more later. Let's leave the 90s behind and we'll talk about what's happened since then. So web services came around in early 2000 and uh, W3C was working on these standards for web services using SOAP, using uh, the web service description language. I was involved in some of that. I think I've repented for my sins by now. But uh, this was another standards nightmare. It was just, it took, I believe, two months to define, come up with a definition that people could sort of agree to of what was a web service. Just two months straight, no other topics in the standards body at all, just two, two months, probably another month to, to write it up in a way that people agreed with. So we didn't get very far, which is probably not a bad thing. <laughs> um, basically what was going on was this notion of taking the enterprise view that Corva and Java had been pushing and really try to apply that to the web. And it was almost comical in hindsight because uh, some of the people, not everybody, but some of the people there just felt that the web people had no idea what they were doing they had it wrong. They didn't have all these properties of these distributed object systems that had been worked on for so long. 
They couldn't possibly make this work. The protocols were too sloppy, there was no type checking, you know, all these kinds of things. Meanwhile, of course, the wedge is growing and growing and growing, um, but they were very adamant that it had to be done in a different way. And ultimately, what you got was just Corva with angle brackets, is what we like to call it, because all the, the descriptions were written in XML, of course, and uh, you're basically doing exactly the same thing as Corva did, but with a different syntax. So web services are thankfully not used on the web. It actually wouldn't work. The reason for that is the scalability problems that you have. When you have to specialize every single interface of every single service that you have out there, there's no way for, you, for that web to even handle that explosion of method calls and understanding what the method calls mean and how you use them one after another, workflows, all that kind of stuff. You just can't do it. Um, of course, web services are still used in the enterprise. I get hate mail occasionally, or I get somebody writing some nasty thing about me on the internet occasionally, still mad about the fact that I give talks like this. They say, I tried to implement a uh, service in REST, and it took me two weeks, and then I did it, I went to my IDE, and I pushed a button, I got Wizdal out in like five seconds. I just wrote a Java class. There's nothing you can say to these people because they don't, they don't understand this difference between the focus on the language and the focus on the distributed system. The focus on building you know, something that uh, is just going to be used locally or pseudo-locally in the case of these sort of small distributed systems versus something that has to scale to the size of the web. So REST came along, was coined in the year 2000 by Real, uh, Roy Fielding in his PhD thesis. How many have read the thesis? Good. More, more hands. Uh, if you look at the thesis, one of the best parts about it is its analysis of the trade-offs involved in the distributed system. If you were to go back to a lot of the things that I've talked about, these RPC systems, they never talk about that kind of stuff. They don't usually talk about the trade-offs involved. They might mention the fact that distribution can have partial failure and things you know, that we, we know, but they won't say, well, these are the properties I'm trying to attain, and so I'm going to make the following trade-offs to get those properties, which is exactly what REST is. REST is an example of doing that. And um, I have to say, for me personally, when I read the REST paper, it, it just opened my eyes. It's like, whoa, that's what I've been missing. And I started to go down that path when I was at Iona Technologies in around this time, 2000. Uh, I was the chief architect, but I also did work internally in building services internally that were used by uh, developers like me. And I started to find that I wasn't using Corva to build those services, I was using RESTful principles to build them instead, which is why I eventually had to leave there. They didn't kick me out, I mean, I left under my own power. But uh, RPC today, okay, here's a question. Do we still use RPC? How many? How many? Come on, you can admit it. Yep. It's probably half raising their hand. And the answer is yes, we do. But are we smarter about it? And I think the answer is somewhat. There's this awareness that has come along that's uh, improved how we view RPC and how we view distributed systems. People understand that there's a difference between local and remote. That used to be you know, an eye-opener for a lot of people. You'd have to start explaining what can go wrong, the differences in latencies, all those kinds of things, and it would dawn on them, like, wow, you're right, I never thought about that. But today, I think most people understand that. The same with partial failure. It's still, I mean, I work at Basho now, so we have REOC, which is this distributed database, and we still run into people who say, well, net splits don't happen that much, so <laughs> why worry about it? And we actually do have people saying that. Uh, not in Basho, mind you. <laughs> Blocking calls. You know, people understand that if you, if you make a call and you block, you're probably doing something wrong. The support for multiple communication patterns. I think people understand that the network is a different medium for making calls to services than just a procedure call in the local space. There's issues with coupling. There's also programming language renaissance going on. I'm going to talk about all these more as we go forward, but 
um, just overall there's a better understanding of scale as well. So when you think about the local versus remote, like we said all along here today, you can't hide these differences. You, you can try to plaster over them, and you try all kinds of games, but you can't do it. So what we do today is we embrace the fact that we have multiple systems that are independent but working together and we take advantage of that. That's how we get redundancy, that's how we get resiliency, reliable systems. Because you can't have one computer be a reliable system. In terms of blocking, if we go back to that idea of the true RPC, the true definition from Wikipedia, for example, then you make a call and you sit there and the thread that made the call just blocks and waits for the reply to come back. I saw the term async RPC used recently and I thought, what is async RPC? Well, it's an example of someone using the term RPC when they really mean message. But an async RPC, I don't think you could actually have one. What does that mean? Um, maybe if you spawn a thread you could do it or, you know, a true procedure call happens in the same thread. It's there and it's back. There is no asynchronicity to it. Uh, you know, a lot of systems today just use messaging. So you send a message later if you need something coming back from the service to which you sent the message, you rendezvous and you find the reply. You consider how messages fit the overall flow of work. Rather than just focusing on these point-to-point -point calls like, oh, this service needs this, so it needs to call that one and get this back. I think today people are a lot more focused on the bigger picture and they think more about message flows through the system and how to deal with those things in the sense of what happens if a message gets lost, what happens if a message gets delayed, what are the consequences for the overall system and people have learned how to deal with those kinds of issues. If you have a true RPC, you don't even have the option of a timeout unless it's hard coded somewhere in the library underneath. So if you look at some of the RPC packages that are available today, they've built in timeouts. And just by doing that alone, they're not really RPC anymore, because you don't put timeouts on local calls. Remember, RPC, the true definition, is local, remote, identical. So once you start to do things to handle the distributed system, it's no longer RPC. You think about communication patterns, you know, this point-to-point -point request reply, that's true RPC. But it ignores things like multicast, broadcast, um, pub sub, all those kinds of messaging patterns that are very useful. One of the things I like to do when I think about distributed systems is actually think about how humans communicate with each other. If you think about that, you know, I can make a phone call and call you up and that's like, almost like an RPC because I say something and hopefully you say something back and it's very synchronous. But if you're not there, I can leave you a message, kind of fire or forget. If you don't reply, I might fire it off again. It's a retry. You know, and you can take these human communi communication patterns and think about distributed systems that way. And so you can tell that an RPC couldn't possibly cover the gamut of what's required there. When you <coughs> try to build all this stuff uh, into programming language, it gets difficult. You can't just take your average standard programming language and decide to extend it to handle these kinds of communication patterns. Uh, the lesson here, I think, that we've learned is that you embrace these protocols. There are ways of using these systems, or sorry, these protocols, to build the systems you need to build without being so focused on programming language and making you know, RPC kind of the king of what you're trying to do. In terms of coupling problems in RPC, RPC actually imposes these app-specific methods that I mentioned earlier. So when you define you know, an RPC, you're really calling a specialized method on the other side of the wire. You're also typically sending some kind of specialized data structure to that method. And if you contrast that with REST, where the verbs are application independent and fixed, the uh, types are just come from a, like a reusable library of types. Those are the content types, the MIME types, things like application JSON, for example. And then we also have content negotiation, where you can have a client that says, I want, I prefer JSON, but if you don't have that, well then just give me HTML and I'll make the best of it. In most RPC systems I've ever seen, you didn't have that choice. The, the, transfer syntax 
basically what you want to call it. The, the way things are transferred over the wire is fixed in part of the RPC framework that you're using. So you're using this particular framework, then you get this style of data, you get this type system, and you get this um, way of putting it on the wire and reading it off the wire. And with other systems like REST, you have very much flexibility there because every application is different. The other thing about RPC is that it has this implied workflow. When you have a set of methods, what is it that unites those methods? It's just sort of a list of methods. How do you know which one to call, which one to call after that? What to do with the data that comes back? Does the data that comes back go into this call next? Or you, know, you don't really have an idea. You have to sit down with whoever wrote the stuff, figure out how that works, or hope that they documented it in some way. And with um, REST, things like REST, HTML, you have hypermedia, hypermedia driving the state transitions. So when you make a call, you get back this representation that says the following, now the, the calls that can come after this are here, 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 here. And it pretty much tells you what to do next. And as I said before, RPC has this fixed transfer syntax. The other thing about RPC that kind of really didn't dawn on me until I started to work more with the web <coughs> was the fact that you had this heavy infrastructure on both ends of the wire. You have to have the same libraries that are decoding the transfer syntax or encoding it for putting it on the wire. And then the protocols that are involved are often not simple. So you have to have the same libraries on both ends to get interoperability for sure. In the days of Corbin, we did have interoperability between different implementations, but it took quite a long time to get there. And uh, there's quite a heavy infrastructure that we were putting on either end at the end of the day. And with uh, other approaches, you can have really lightweight clients, really lightweight servers that don't take a lot of uh, effort or infrastructure. You have this language renaissance. I loved programming languages for a long time. Uh, starting around 2000, it seemed like we were kind of stuck, you know, maybe we were just kind of stuck with Java and it was just going to become, you know, the, the language to use for everything and C++ is still around, of course. But um, that's changed since then. There's this whole renewal in the interest in uh, functional programming. How many are doing functional programming? About, about a third, probably. There's new languages on the JVM. I've never been a Java guy. I've done Java. You can have it. <laughs> um, I never liked it. I was a hardcore C++ guy. Started with it in 1988, and I just didn't have the kinds of problems that people seem to have with it. But when Java came around, it was kind of one of those things where you look at it and go, eh, C++ still works for me. I'll just stick with that. As we moved along, you know, it got better, and so I did some of it. But then, you know, I just, I just never warmed up to it. But the JVM, on the other hand, I think is absolutely brilliant the work that's gone into the JVM and what it's done for languages in uh, general has been excellent. So you've seen these new languages coming about on the JVM and I would encourage, how many people are using new languages on the JVM? Scala or Clojure or uh, even JRuby, yep. Um, I would encourage you to do that. How many Java programmers do we have? Everybody? A Java programmer? Someone who uses Java to program. That's my definition. <laughs> uh, I would encourage you to look at those other languages. And of course you have JavaScript everywhere. But my favorite is what says on my shirt here, Erlang. And I want to talk a little bit about that. When you think about what's in that node on distributed computing, there was those two paths that I mentioned, the path of language and the path of distributed computing problems. Both had to be addressed. And Erlang is the best example that I know of personally that actually does that. How many Erlang programmers do we have? One and a half. Okay. Uh, but it really does look at this distributed computing problem and give you ways to deal with it. And it also gives you a reasonably nice language for dealing with it. So it's made good progress on both of those uh, the, both of those paths. Um, unfortunately, many ignore it because it's not on the JVM. It also has prolog-based syntax. How many prolog programmers? All right. 
Yes, a few. Um, last week I was at uh, another conference and I asked how many Erlang programmers there were and about five out of 80 people raised their hand. And how many Prolog programmers, I expected zero or one. There were actually eight more Prolog than Erlang, it shocked me. But um, uh, at that same conference there was a uh, talk about JavaScript by Brendan. I created JavaScript. So he's showing all these examples of JavaScript, and I'm sitting there in the audience looking at this, saying, how can people complain about Erlang's syntax? Look at that. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> so, I don't know. Uh, and of course, Creston, who's here, you know, the, the master of ceremonies here at Goto Aarhus, has developed Erjang, which is an Erlang implementation that sits on the JVM. So you might want to take a look at that if you're interested. In terms of scaling, uh, developers have a better grasp of scaling systems today, where you know, in, the, in years gone by they really didn't. So things like shared nothing architectures, cap theorem, uh, SEDA, stage of event-driven architectures, the work that Amazon and Google have done, Martin's own mechanical sympathy, you know, kind of you can't have the scale without the performance, and Martin's going to talk about that later. And then just the operating system improvement and networking and uh, supporting these kinds of systems with measurement tools. Caching, think of caching. Um, an RPC is very hard to cache because you don't know if it's read, write, read only, or what. And um, when you're scaling a system, you have to have caching. So in summary, RPC, in my opinion, is convenient but flawed, convenient but incorrect. We should have listened to Rick Shantz and his RFC 684 a long time ago. I don't know what I would have done with myself had I done that, but I guess I'll never know. Uh, but fortunately, the scale of the web has pushed us into new paths. Even within the enterprise, uh, things like REST are being used for services that in olden days might have been uh, web services. So my lesson is, friends don't let friends commit RPC. <laughs> Any questions? Josh's question is, why do people persist? If we know all this stuff that I've just covered, why do people persist in wanting to use uh, these frameworks that try to hide distribution? And I think, sadly, the answer is that um, people are lazy. You know, they, they want to push that button in their IDE and just have stuff pop out. And I mentioned some of that hate mail that I get. That's exactly what people yell at me for. You can't do it that way. I, you know, I can go with my IDE and do this, and I have my whole system up and running. And you know, some of it's just apathy. People have to get their work done. They don't really care about their job. They just, you know, they're uh, ticking a checkbox. So it comes down to uh, people just wanting to get something done out the door quickly. Maybe, maybe not taking responsibility that they should for the system. It's really not a technical problem in a sense, it's more of a, a human problem. That's right. Uh, Eric's point is that by the strict definition of RPC, not everybody's doing RPC. People are doing, you might call it RPC-like things, but like I said before, when they take into account the timeouts that can happen, when they take into account the fact that the, the network can split, then they are actually thinking about the distributed system, and that's really not RPC. Anything else? Did I bust the myth? <laughs> Thanks for coming.